Thank you very much uh, for the um, opportunity to meet again like this. Uh, this is our third uh, session, our third evening, and um, we are really discussing money matters. And, and just to just to remind each other, we started off on Monday, and Monday evening we were talking about um, a city without walls. And the idea there was to say that not all our money problems are problems of money. And we, we looked at um, you know how lazy our brains are, we look at behavioral finance, and then we moved on um, on, on Tuesday, which was yesterday, we then started talking about the art of budgeting. And, and as the introduction has said, we, we covered a few things. So tonight we want to focus on debt management, and then tomorrow we will deal with financial emergencies. So debt management, and, um, and, and as always, we, we always start by showing the, the, the verses and the memory text that we are building our discussion on, um, so that we demonstrate that God has not left us without guidance when it comes to finances. So you demonstrate that there's nothing that pertains to our lives, including our finances, that is not covered in the Bible. So, so the verses that we will unpack um, tonight, where we'll base everything that we'll discuss tonight, are found in the first one, is found in Deuteronomy. Um, I always struggle with the pronunciation. Well, Deuteronomy. It's not even English, so it's fine. Um, it's not Zulu, so... 15 verse 6, and the Bible says that when I have blessed you, you shall be lenders, not borrowers. And, and it, then, it then says that the evidence of blessing should be the absence of debt. When I have blessed you, you won't be in debt, you'll be lenders. And remember, lenders are investors. And that's what the Bible is saying. And, and I, always, I always love... Um, Sorry, I need to set the alarm again. Yes, I must not forget this. There we go. I always love at, at, at have, you, have you heard someone giving a testimony? Uh, and, um, you know, it's testimony time during church. And the and I, I just want to thank the Lord. And I just want to thank the Lord that finally the bond has been approved. And, and, and we want to get to a point where we don't see debt as a blessing. And we'll talk about some, some, some ideas uh, where, where people believe there's good debt and bad debt. We'll talk a little bit around that. But the Bible says that. And the other verse that we'll focus on and we'll demonstrate what this verse means is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The Bible says that the borrower becomes the slave of the lender and 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 we'll play around with the with the with the metaphor of slavery and we'll demonstrate it in numbers and of course um the other verse that we will that supports the idea of discussing how we manage our debt is found in second kings chapter two um so the second kings chapter four uh, verse seven we know the story here's a widow who who had to give the prophet her last meal and 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 um and and and, and remember it starts by saying the widow says um well you know what my husband who loved the lord has passed away and and the prophet obviously gives the last food the last meal to the prophet and the prophet turns this widow into a cooking oil monopoly capitalist she owns the cooking oil market in the area she fills the jars and sells and then the prophet says this says this take this money and go and settle your debts. Um, and again, it's a weird thing. Um, people who love the Lord, but they leave their, their wives in debt. We'll talk about that another time. But she says, because of this money that you have, the first thing you must do is take care of your debt and then leave on the rest. And the idea then is to say that getting out of debt and managing debt is such an important thing that when the Lord blesses us, he likes us not to be in debt. And that is why in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul then says, the only debt you must have is the debt of love. That's the one you can never repay. All other debts, can you try and stay free of them? So we, we are building then this of debt management from a biblical point of view around these verses. But remember what we said when we started on, on Monday. We said that one of our sources will be research. Another source will be common sense. We're also going to apply common sense. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Of course, um, when we start discussing tonight, the seven steps out of debt, we will, we will base, for those who, who believe in the Bible, for those who have read um, a lot of books that are biblical books, uh, books that are religious books, books written by prophets and things like that, another book that's quite good is Adventist Home, all the steps out of debt will follow from this Adventist Home, page 393. Quite an interesting thing that Ellen White, when she writes about debt, she says, this has been the curse of your life. In other words, 
the, 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 the prophet sees debt as a curse in our lives. And the idea, then she says, she says this, she says you must avoid it as someone who avoids smallpox. Of course, you might not think smallpox is a big, is a big deal. Back then, smallpox was a big deal. And the point she's making is that we should be avoiding debt as far as the way we avoid diseases. And of course, we, 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 we have uh, the coronavirus. People are washing their hands. I hope you still wash your hands. Maybe we, we've forgotten about it. Maybe we are tired of washing hands. But we are wearing masks because we understand that we don't want to die because of the disease. We don't want to be hospitalized because of the disease. And then the idea is that we should be avoiding debt like a disease. Now, why should we be doing that? And I want to start there. I want to start by showing what role does that play in our world? Does it build our wealth or does it erode our wealth? Can debt be seen? Can debt be profitable? Now, if debt is a curse, I can never call it good. But can debt be useful? We'll look at something like that, but we'll also see what role. Remember now, we are talking about money simply because we've understood that money is a tool and it helps us build our lives. But a tool, if you don't know how to use it, we spoke about this on Monday. We said, if you don't know how to use a tool, the tool can hurt you. Now, debt is one of those things where the tool becomes a weapon. If, 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 if we think about it, if you think about, about somebody who, who wants to build a house, right? A brick to a builder is very useful because it can build them a structure, it can build a home, it can build a school, it can build a business. But the same brick in the hands of a criminal can kill somebody. And I want to say that while debt sometimes can be useful to build our wealth, it can also become a weapon and hurt our wealth. And I want us to look at this differentiation. And, and our aim is to avoid it as we avoid a disease. And of course, we we'll look at a few things. But I want to start by, by looking at the statistics. Remember, I said we will use the Bible, but we will use research, we will use common sense just to understand and have a better relationship with our money. Now, I know that we see graphs almost every day. Um, so I thought, let's not use graphs to discuss stats. Let's use actual visuals and money. This is 10,000 rands. And if 10,000 rands is too much money, imagine like 100 rands, which they are 10 rands, so that it's 1,000 rands. The concept will still be the same. Now, statistics are telling us that in South Africa, on average, people spend, so if I earn uh, 10,000 rands, the statistics are saying that I will spend about 73,000 rands, I mean, sorry, I will spend about 73%. In other words, I'll spend 7,000 um, 300 on debt repayment of my income. Now, think about this. We've already shown last night that we spend on average 160 hours working hard for our money. Now, the statistics in South Africa are saying the money that I've worked hard for, I then spend 72% of it repaying debt. Maybe that's not a problem, but, but I want you to think about what it means for our world. And that's why I want to, to contextualize the importance of managing our debt if we are interested. Remember now we are talking about people who are interested in building wealth and having a better relationship with money. If you are not interested in debt, probably you, you will enjoy debt, you won't avoid it like small pots. But here's, here's what this thing is saying. It is saying that when I've worked so hard and I earn my money, Many of us in this country are spending 72, 73% of our income repaying debt. Now, I want you to think about what this means. Then on Sabbath or on Sunday, your church then says, I'll see pay it tithe in Zawad. Remember, they are asking tithe from the 100%, not from the 27% that remains. When you go to school to register your child and you want to show them you can afford the school fees, you show them a pay slip of 100%. You no longer tell them, which is around the same selling no 27%. So all our life and our expenses that we get into are based on 100%, yet we've already spent 72%, 73% of our income repaying debt. Is that a way to build wealth? I don't know. Now, somebody will then say, I, I stole it. Not all of us are in bad debt. Many of us are in good debt. But, but the statistics then are then showing. I went and looked at, um, at, at what kind of debt do people have? Because before we judge and say, I'm an, people are over indebted, what if people are spending 72% of their income on debt that builds wealth? 
Now, the statistics, again, are saying to us that most of our debt, and I've circled it in red on the slide, most of our debt are for credit facilities. And if you talk about credit facilities, we are talking about credit cards, we are talking about store cards, we are talking about loading accounts. Um, and, and, and most of our debt are around consumption debt. Consumption debt now is the debt that we use to purchase things that we, we just use and finish, things that don't generate us income. Now, that is very worrying. It is then saying to us that we are in debt, but the debt we are in is not the debt that builds our wealth, which means that many of us are struggling to afford our daily life. We finance it with debt, let alone the idea of building generational wealth, which we'll talk about on Friday. Because the Bible, I think it's Proverbs 13, verse 22, the Bible says that a good person builds, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Now, if most of our debt is around consumption debt, we don't stand a chance of building generational wealth. Forget generational wealth, just the idea of affording your life tomorrow. We don't stand a chance because you can't afford our lives today because of debt. And therefore, if we are to have a better relationship with money, we've got to do something about this debt. But here's the other worrying thing about the debt that we have. The, the, the one thing that worries me is that more than half of people who are in debt, they are behind on their repayments. So even the 73% of our income that goes to debt repayment, we are not even on time with our debt repayment on consumption date. Now, this is a disaster waiting to happen. It means that if all most of our money is sitting on debt repayments, it means if a disaster were to happen, if I were to have an emergency, I will probably end up in more debt because the 27% that remains of my income is probably buying food. Some of us are starting to buy food on credit. I, I understand many retailers now can allow us to buy food on credit. So how do we improve this situation is what we want to talk about. Uh, this evening but also if, if 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 we are sitting on consumption debt we don't stand a good chance in building wealth and remember when we started on monday i i borrowed the words of paul and um, in, in 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 timothy where paul says and, and and his words are saying that many will have the appearance of of will will have the appearance of godliness but they, they, they deny the power thereof many of us have an appearance of wealth because debt allow us to look like when we are not right but if you think about what wealth means if someone says i have net worth wealth happens when our assets are, are bigger than our liabilities now if most of our money is going to consumption debt which means our money is going to debt that doesn't build assets it means that we are busy accumulating debt without accumulating assets we are not getting wealthier as the months progress we are getting poorer and therefore we if, if you look at um the, the the cash flow patterns of wealthy people who are building wealth and and people who are called middle class it's quite it's quite an interesting thing though that we, we we classify people as middle class by their income not their net worth so we say someone is middle class they earn a lot of money but most of their money is used to repay debt to pay expenses and repay debt yet those who are actually rich they actually build assets and they live off income coming out of their assets and if they have any debt that debt is to build more assets and that's how you build wealth and, and i want us to talk about that if we are to build wealth we have to manage our debt and i hope i've made a case for why it's important to have a session like we have tonight where we talk about managing our debt because many of us are swimming in consumption debt so as i said we stand no chance then if our debt is consumption debt we stand no chance to meet the expectation the expectation of proverbs 13 verse 22. now now if we call ourselves christians and, and and i want us to think about this idea of being christians because you know christianity it becomes part of our identity and um, you know and and the values of being christian someone says that to be christian is to be christ-like and if you look and, and i know i'm digressing a bit but i'm trying to show you how high the standard is that is set for those who call themselves christian if you look at what Christianity means, you, you only have to go to the early church when, Christ, when the Christian church was being set up in the book of Acts. You find them in chapter one, 
um, where, 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 where Jesus is, is about to leave earth and he goes to heaven, but he's setting up the Christian church. And in chapter 1, verse 8, what does Jesus say? He says that, um, first he starts by saying, it is, it, it is necessary that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come and do more things. You'll do more things when the Holy Spirit has come. And then he says in verse 8 of chapter 1 of the book of Acts, he says this, he says, when the Holy Spirit has arrived, you shall become witnesses, not just in Judea, but throughout the ends of the world. Now let's understand what it means to be a witness. And I want to wanna show you how high the standard is for a Christian. And I want to show you why yesterday I suggested that one of your budget categories must be around your spirituality. Because your spirituality gives you your matching orders. Look at what it means to be a witness for Christ. Think of a court scenario. If I'm at court, right, and, and I am accused of killing somebody, I didn't kill anyone. This is an example because we are recording. I didn't kill anyone. Don't call the police. It's an example. So let's say I'm at court. I'm accused of killing somebody. And then I say, you are my witness. So I call on you and say, you are going to become my witness right remember you are my witness not the witness of those who are accusing me so my expectation when i say you are my witness is that you will deliver evidence that proves me right i'm still working together right i hope so now it means when you take the witness stand if i say i didn't kill the person and you are my witness your evidence are we together your evidence must then prove that I didn't kill people. So when Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses, he says, if I say something in the Bible, your job is to prove me right. When you take the witness stand with your life, your life must demonstrate, must give evidence that proves me right. So when the Bible says, I expect you to create generational wealth, if I'm a Christian, I should then do my best to do everything that makes me create generational wealth. And that is one of those things, especially consumption debt, that will disturb the project. That doesn't make us credible witnesses. So that's why we're having this session. And I've already touched on these verses. I'm going to skip on them. Let's get into it. Now, we must appreciate, because I, I don't like us to assume um, we, we get into debt because of wrong reasons. Some of us have legitimate reasons, not excuses, reasons. That explains why we get into debt, but they don't necessarily excuse staying longer into debt. We have reasons why we get into debt. And if we were to understand those reasons, it's a first point on how to deal them with debt. Let's talk about some of them. We've already spoken about it on Monday when you say some of us get into debt because of the way we think about money and the way our emotions are applied to money. Because we fail to control our thinking, we end up getting into debt. Because I couldn't, I couldn't resist what was called a sale. I thought a sale is me saving. I then start spending money I didn't prepare for. Because I couldn't resist um, holding on to things. I went on a test drive and I wanted to hold on to it because of the issue of loss aversion. I then enter into debt. Right? Some of us have gotten into debt because of the structure of our economy, because of where we come from. Where we come from, many of us were excluded from economic participation. Where we come from, many of us were excluded from participating in the economy in certain skills, in certain businesses. There were certain skills that people couldn't get into. And that prevented even the best amongst us. Some of us know our parents who are very clever. If they were given a chance that we have, they probably would have built generational wealth. And because they couldn't do that because of where we come from, many of us had to start off with debt. Many of us had to start off supporting two families, be, being sandwiched between two worlds. The world we come from of poverty, trying to try and, and flatten the curve of poverty where we come from, but also try to create a better world for ourselves and our children. Now, it is very hard to do these two things with one source of income. Now, it ends us up into debt because of where we come from. So some of us, and, and remember again, if you think about um, you know, the fact that there were certain areas that were kept for certain color of people, it meant that the areas that were developed, the areas that had businesses, the areas that had that industry were far from where we live such that many of us don't have the opportunity of being able to stay at home and still go to our work. We, have, we end up financing two homes, the home where we come from and the home that is closer to where we work. And it creates a situation where we don't necessarily afford our life. So we start off with that. We can't afford to buy cars cash. So we start off with that. There are some legitimate reasons why we get into debt, right? But here's a problem. 
while we start off with that, we shouldn't end up end off with that. While it is understandable that many of us might not avoid starting off with that, but many of us can avoid staying in debt for longer. And that is why that this is what I want us to deal with. But the other reason why we get into debt is that not many of us understand how debt works. There are some of us who, who you know, we get to a point where somebody believes that available credit is money they own. Somebody walks into a shop, they've already paid their account, and then they walk out, the, 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 the statement says available credit, and they, in their mind, Available credit means I can still buy because we have not understood how debt works, right? And, and that's a reason why we get into that. But the Bible says something interesting, and I, and I open with that verse, and I want to demonstrate to you how practical the Bible is. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 7, and, and again, we get into debt when we don't understand how debt works. We don't always think that debt is hurting our world. But once we understand how debt works, we start choosing differently how we get into debt, what kind of debt we get into. Some of us, all they needed was an understanding, some literacy, and their lives will change. And, 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 and I want to talk about that. Now, Proverbs 22 verse 7 says this, the borrower becomes the slave of the lender. And, and, and I want us to, 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 to really... You, you, you know, let's not read the Bible like we're reading a Bona magazine. You know, a Bona magazine has nothing to do with you. I'm being entertained. The Bible has a lot to do with us. Let the Bible talk to you about your life. Let's make it practical. If let's think about slavery, right? Look at these slaves who were who were working to build pyramids for the Egyptians for, for in Egypt. The slaves did the work. That's what slavery is about. The slaves do all the work. But the pyramids don't belong to the slaves. So the slave works to build an empire, but the empire is not that of the slave. So when the Bible says the borrower is the slave of the lender, the Bible is saying the borrower works hard, but the empire that the borrower is building is that of the master, not of the borrower. It's that of the lender. Now, if you were to pick up any financial statement of any bank in this country, and these are freely available. I've blocked them because I've got small children. I don't want to be sued. But they, you can Google it. They are publicly available. No one should be suing anyone. But I've blocked them because yeah, Now, if you have to pick up the financial statements of any of any bank, you're going to see Proverbs 22, verse 7 uh, 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 come alive. Because look at, the, look at these banks. Their income that they get from interest, it is because businesses and people are in debt. It's another story why others are in debt, but it's because of debt. And that debt generates enough income for this bank to be able to pay all its expenses and still be left with profit without running any other line of business except the business of debt. Now, do, do you see other, other banks have been able to have two CEOs because people and companies are in debt. Other, other banks have been able to, to, to build amazing buildings that, that are beautiful. In other words, because of people and businesses being in debt, some businesses have been able to build an empire. Slavery means I work hard for someone else's. Now, once you understand that, you start saying, how can I turn debt to work for me and become a slave than me become a, becoming a slave? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, the other challenge that we have about understanding debt is that we also don't understand how the different types of debts are priced. Have we understood that many of us will approach our debt and our investing differently? And, and let me talk a little bit about, about that. If you were to understand how interest rates work, right? So if you were, if you were to think about it, interest rates, for example, for, 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 for bonds, like if I'm getting into a debt for, um, for, for a bond, I can I can be charged up to 12.5, which is which is which is the the, the lending rate, the, the the repo rate times two plus something else. I think it's plus five or something like that, right? So so you can depending on the type of debt, the interest that I'm charged. Now remember, interest is what the lender charges you. It's almost like the rent you are charged for using someone else's money, right? So so the riskier the debt is, the higher the interest. And, and, th and therefore, you find that all the debt that is secured, when we say it's secured, we are saying, I'm getting into debt, and, and the lender has an asset that they can use as security, so that if I don't pay, they are able to repossess my house. Once they have that comfort, they don't charge me a higher rent because they don't have a higher risk. 
But if I've got debt for clothing, debt for food, I mean, if I buy food on debt and I don't pay, they can't come back and repossess the food. Because obviously the food is in your stomach. That's a really messy business, right? So they will charge you higher because the risk is higher. And therefore, you then find, once you understand how that works, you start saying to yourself, should I start investing while I'm still swimming in consumption debt that is very expensive, that is more expensive than the returns I'm getting on my investing? Once you understand how debt works, you start prioritizing differently in terms of your, your investing versus being in debt. But, but if you don't understand this, you're going to be swimming in consumption debt on one hand. One hand, you say you are investing and you think you are building wealth, only to find that you are working backwards. But if you understand how it works, just that understanding can help you. So there's, there's different types of debt. There's what we call very bad debt, consumption debt. And, and this is debt that is expensive. I've shown you it's expensive because the interest is very high. Debt for personal loans, for things that have nothing to do with business. Debt for clothing accounts, for example, um, food, uh, things like that. That is what we call consumption debt. It's debt for things that don't make me money. They are unsecured and they lose their value very fast. Your clothes, while you are still paying a six month account, those clothes are out of fashion. You now need to buy new clothes. While you are paying for this furniture, they bring a flat screen. You are busy with a flat screen, you are still paying for a flat screen, they put a care screen, right? Now, those kind of debt, they are very expensive, but they don't build wealth. Unless, of course, you are buying a TV to run a, cine a cinema to help people watch Ellen White the movie. Otherwise, um, that debt is not making money. That kind of debt is called consumption debt. It's very expensive. And, and, and Adventist Home, Ellen White says, this is a curse. Avoid consumption debt. If you are interested in building wealth, consumption debt should be the debt that we avoid at all costs. Because one, it's very expensive. Number two, it is not used to build assets that make us money. Remember, to build wealth, you build wealth by accumulating assets that are bigger in value than the debt that you have. And consumption debt, we should be avoiding it. Now, one of the things that I want to suggest Remember, guys, this is, this is awareness. It is, not, it is not financial advice. If you want financial advice, go and sit with a financial advisor who sits and goes through your specific thing. This is awareness. So that when you sit with a financial advisor, they don't start selling you product. You have some understanding. I would suggest that you shouldn't, if you still have consumption debt, if you still have a clothing account, if you still have a, a, a food account, if you still have a personal loan, you should actually not be investing. Why is that? Let me give you an example. I want to show you how debt works and how we can manage our debt so that it doesn't affect our wealth. Let's say here is a Zodwa. Zodwa Wenkosi, not Zodwa Wabandu. Zodwa Wabandu is sorted. Zodwa Wenkosi needs need some help. Now, Zodwa has a clothing account at uh, Zedgas, right? So she has a clothing account. She owes 5,000 rands, and the interest she's paying on this clothing account is 27%. Remember, it's consumption debt, so the interest is very high. So she's paying 480 rand every month. She's going to be done in 12 months' time. But Zodwa, at least, and, and, and you know, here's the thing. We like to console ourselves. With, I, I, Bazarani, I might be in debt, but at least I'm investing. So while Zodwa is repaying this debt, at least for Siam Zodwa, it's not so bad. She's investing. She's got an investment account where she's earning. She's very large. She's earning 15%. Very few investments that are legal and, and, and regulated will earn you 15%. So she's spending 750 rands a month investing in this investment account. So Zodra is, is feeling good about herself. She believes she's building wealth because one hand, while she is in debt, she's investing. But look at what is happening. At the end of the day, the loan of 5,000, the debt of 5,000, she would have paid after 12 months, 5,761 rands. In other words, she's paid 761 rands interest on the 750 rents that she's busy paying as an investment she has earned 645 rand she's building wealth but her net result is a minus but she's comfortable she's building wealth but once she understands how debt works she's gonna say you know what i rather take this 750 and repay this debt because i'm earning 15 but i'm paying 27 this is a minus formula she takes the 750, she adds it to the 480. She's done with this debt in five months' time. And she takes all this money and puts it on investment. Now, suddenly, she's earned 
she's paying 305 grand, she's earning 329. Her, her formula is a positive one. So, so the idea is that while you are in consumption debt, rather finish off consumption debt if you want to build wealth and then start building wealth after you've dealt with consumption debt because it's very expensive. Of course, some of us are in neutral debt. Neutral debt is, is a debt that doesn't necessarily generate income, but has potential. You know, yes, I've got debt for a car because I'm using a car to go and generate income, but for me to generate income, it doesn't have to be the most expensive debt. Yes, I've got debt for a house because I must stay somewhere um, so that I can continue generating income. But you know, but for it to make me money, the house I live in, I must sell it at a higher value. And that's not guaranteed, by the way, because I have no control over values. So until I sell it, it's costing me money, right? And of course, there's debt that we have for, for student loans and things like that. Yes, it might get me a job, it might not because the economy. So it's neutral because it's trying to build my wealth capacity, but it's a gamble itself. Again, the idea there, if I look at, and here's the other thing, the reason why we started off our series by dealing with the way we think about money, our mindset, was so that even when we approach, some of us can't avoid um, not having a uh, debt for, for our vehicles. But, but the point is, if you are not wealthy, you should not go for the most expensive because a, more, a, a car is not necessarily helping you generate income directly. So the suggestion is very simple, right? If I look at, uh, at cars, the suggestion is always, is always saying, if you are still financing buying cars, if you are still financing with debt, rather, rather buy secondhand cars and try and pay them off very fast. Because, because here's, here's a simple reason. Cars lose their value as soon as you buy it. If I go to a dealership right now and I buy a brand new car, as soon as I bought it and I drive out, if someone meets me at the robot and wants to buy that car, they are not going to pay the amount I've just paid two minutes ago because it loses, I mean, it, some, some cars lose uh, up to 30% the day I buy them and I, and, I, and I move them out. But if I come and buy it after two weeks from somebody else, I can buy a spray for a brand new car smelling. I would have actually saved 30% already. If you think I'm lying, let's look at some of the things. Let's look at this thing. If someone buys a brand new car for 250,000, remember we are talking about building wealth and wealth is built when the value of my asset is bigger than my debt. Then I've got positive net wealth. Look at this car. If I buy a brand new car, on year one, it has already lost 25%. Look at this car. I'm buying it on debt, which means I've taken out a loan, car finance for 250,000 to buy a 250,000 rent car. A year from now, it would have lost 25%. So it is, it's now worth 187,000. So my asset is worth 187,000. But my debt has only dropped to 210,000. So my net wealth when it comes to this car is a minus. If I went and bought the same car, but it's two years old, to me, in year one, in, in year two, it would have been worth 163,000. So I go and take out a loan for 163,000, but because it's a second hand car, the, the, the value it loses, it starts dropping. So it's no longer using 25% in year two, it's now used, losing just 10%, right? So, so the value of the car, is now 146,000, but my debt is 137,000. My net wealth is positive. You don't build wealth by having your debt that is higher than the value of your car. That's why it's always suggested that if you are still building wealth, rather buy cars that are second hand so that your debt and your value of your car doesn't get eroded too fast. If you think I'm lying, you can go and, and Google a brand new, this was in 2017, for example, a brand new Polo was 180,000 rents. If I were to buy the same Polo that has only traveled one week, 500 kilometers, it still smells new. And remember, if you are buying it to off in church, um, if you bought it on, on, on Friday and it is 500 kilometers, you are the same as the person who bought it on Sunday as a brand new car last Sunday and they drive it, it's still second hand. You, you still, look at this person, they've saved 41,000 rents by just waiting one week. Um, how about this Mercedes Benz? Someone who were to buy it in 2017 as brand new was gonna spend 540,000. If they just waited one month and bought a one month old uh, Mercedes Benz, they would have saved 75,000 rents. My favorite car, Jeep Grand Cherokee, I will tell you a story one day about it. Brand new at that time, it was 924,000. If you bought it and it's got 2,000 kilometers, 
You've just saved 324,000 rands, which is the value of another car. This is what we are talking about. You say, if we think differently about wealth, we'll start realizing that there are certain things where we are eroding our wealth too fast for things that are not building our assets. Of course, um, and, and I'm going to skip this one because we are trying to chase time. One of the things that you will realize about wealthy people, uh, and I suggest you read a book, uh, A Millionaire Next Door, you will realize that wealthy people generally normally buy second-hand cars unless they've got so much money that buying a brand new car is as good as going to buy a home, right? And they keep them for about seven years, longer than um, us who pay off five years and then after five years, we want to change the car. And, and, and they keep them longer for than seven years so that you start enjoying. You know, many of us have never tasted not having installments because we think installments are normal, right? So we move from one installment to the next one. If you were to keep a car for longer, and you start saving your money for the next car and start investing that, suddenly you then change the thing around wealth and debt. And, and these are some of the tips. You can read those tips. I'm not going to go through them because we're just creating an awareness. Another interesting debt that we've got is the debt on a house, for example. Someone goes and buys a house, a 500,000 rand house, and not realizing that after 20 years in the house that you live in, you would have spent 2.1 million rands. You would have gained value if after 20 years you can sell the house for more than 2.1 million because you spent money on repayment, you spent on levies. Until you sell the house, the house is costing you money, right? So sometimes you must stop calling our houses investment. Just say it's a house, I'm living in it. Yes, you can play around with it. When you talk about investment, you talk about how do you play around with the equity that is in your house so you can build wealth. But while you are not doing that, a house is just a home we stay in and it's costing me this much. Once we understand that, we might think differently about the way we approach that, right? And again, I'm going to skip all of this. And let's talk about what people are calling profitable debt. Because there are some people who say, no, but brother, sorry, there's what we call good debt. And I agree, profitable debt, debt can be profitable if, if I can use debt to buy assets that generate enough cash to repay the debt themselves and still pay me some money. Now, suddenly, that debt has helped me to build wealth. There are debts like that. For example, debt that I can get into to buy property that I'm renting out and the rent that I'm collecting is enough to pay for, for the bond and still make me some profit and pay for all the costs. That's the kind of debt. Debt can be a tool also for those who want to expand their businesses and, and they expand the business and the business generates enough income, enough cash to repay the debt, pay the interest and still pay me some profit. Then my wealth formula is working out well because my asset is bigger than my, my, than my debt, but also is generating enough income to pay for my expenses. So debt can become useful. But here's a problem about anything that becomes a tool. A tool can quickly become a weapon. We know of companies that ended up with too much of what they called good debt to the point where they are over indebted, they can no longer afford to pay their debt. And, and, and I can tell you many stories about companies like that. If you find that you need to have profitable debt, some of the tips that are, 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 are important is that if you take out expensive, I mean, if you take out profitable debt to build a business, make sure that you've done your business plan and your business plan is showing you that the cash generated from that investment will be enough to pay for that debt. Otherwise, that debt will get you into, 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 into bankruptcy. But also, if you are entering into what they call profitable debt, make sure that you build enough reserve for the times where the business is low. If you are buying, if you are using debt to buy property because you've got a tenant, remember that there might be four months where there's no tenant. Now you put yourself at risk. When we talk about financial emergencies, when we talk about it tomorrow, and we'll unpack this a little bit. Right. So those are the type of things that you think about. While debt may be profitable, if you don't manage it very well, what used to be a, a tool can become a weapon and hurt you. And that's the point that I wanted to then make. Now, let's then, in the last 10 minutes of this discussion, let's then talk about if I find myself in too much debt. So, Kulani, you've said to me, consumption debt, I must make sure I run away from it as someone who runs away from a disease. But come on, man. I'm already sitting in consumption debt. I'm already spending more than I earn. I did the budget that you spoke about last night. And when I did the budget, 
All I saw was a minus. I saw income of 20,000, but I saw expenses of 25,000. I'm in the red. I'm sitting with consumption debt, and you, Kolani, are saying to me that if I have consumption debt and I have not dealt with it, man, I'm in trouble as far as building wealth is concerned. How do I get out of debt? How do I use the art of budgeting to start living within my means. When I live within my means, how do I go and kill consumption debt quite fast so that I start on a journey of building wealth? I start on a journey of sitting with wealth, with debt that is building wealth. If you go and read, and I'm gonna suggest that you go and read the study that was done between UNISA and Momentum. Remember when we started on Monday, I said one of our sources of information is research that has been done so that I don't come here and shoot from the hip we look at research. There's a research that was done by Momentum and UNISA. And they were saying, what are the habits of wealthy people? And one of the habits that they saw about wealthy people is that wealthy people avoided consumption debt. And each time you found them with debt, the debt they had was debt that builds assets that generate income. But how do I get out? But I'm sitting with debt of consumption. How do I get out? And I want us to talk about that in these last 10 minutes, and then we end. And here I'm creating awareness. I'm going to suggest you to get hold of a book called Adventist Home and you go and reach page 393. All the seven steps out of debt are found in that book. That's how amazing God has been to, to, to his people. He has revealed these things in the Bible. He has revealed it to those who are religious writers, religious leaders, and prophets. He has really revealed them. So step number one, and I know it sounds so silly, we have to decide to get out of debt. You know, if somebody still thinks, you know, there are people who take ownership. I mean, I'm not going to say, I'm not I'm not going to say, 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 I'm not going to Debt is not always good for you, and start deciding to get out of debt. One of the interesting things about the Bible, if you were to read, um, I'm just going to summarize now these steps, right? If you were to read the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8, and, and it's quite an interesting thing. You find Daniel and his friends, they, they, are, kept, they are held captive into Babylon, and then of course, obviously you know the story, Nebuchadnezzar said they must eat the food that they were giving them, etc., etc. And remember, they were captives in Babylon. So you don't, you don't sit as a captive and start, and start uh, creating your own rules. There was a danger that if they deny what the king wants them to, to do, they will die. Some of us have already accepted that. We don't see a way out. But I want to say that if you decide to get out of debt, You'll be surprised that you start you start seeing seeing opportunities of getting out of debt. Have you noticed that when you've decided that you start seeing many polos on the road? The polos have already been there, but you had filtered them out until you decided that I want a polo. You start seeing many polos as if there's a truck, a watulula on every intersection. Once you've decided to do something, your brain opens up to start seeing opportunities to do that. So decide to get out of debt. And then number two, seek divine help. I've already shown you that our money problems are problems with our thinking. They are problems with our emotions. And therefore, we need some divine help. We need some emotional control. And the Bible, and the Bible says that who can know the heart? It is deceitful. And maybe we need some divine help. We need something above the normal to actually start think, thinking differently. And I'm going to skip all of that, right? And then number three, draw up your budget. You know, your budget is very important in helping you identify where, where your money is going. You'll be surprised to start seeing the things that are causing your money to go away. There are some unknown, unknown insurances you got into. You know, some of us, and, 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 and I'm not confessing here, some of us ended up with debit orders that we don't remember how we got into them because the voice on the phone was too nice to resist. And then you got it now. The next thing you got a debit order for, for, for saving for saving rhinos. You must save rhinos, but some of us have families that need saving, but we are busy with animals. Now you are saying, what are these debit orders that I don't remember? Some of us have bank charges because we got into this account because the phone call said, Hello, Mr. Stolen, you are in the top one percent. People like you have an account like this. Now you end up with an account you don't afford. Now the budget shows you all those things. So if you were to take it on Zodo, for example, look at her. Every month she gets deeper and deeper into debt. How can she use the budget to get out of this debt? 
First of all, one of the important things, and these are her expenses that she's got. She's got, she earns 18,000 rands, but she's, she's spending 22,000 rands. Every month, she's in the red. If you see some of her expenses, she's also paying off some debt. She's got a clothing account. She's got a furniture account. She's got a personal loan account. On top of that, she's got a, a credit card because she must finance this, this shortfall. Now, the first thing you must be doing, it is pointless to take water out of a sinking boat uh, that has holes. Because as you take out water, the water comes in in the holes. The first thing you must do, plug the holes first before you get out of debt. Just stop the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. Start spending within your means. What did Zotwa do? She used the budget. Remember what we learned about the budget? We said you label your budget once and needs, essentials and non-essentials. She started looking at the things she, she can cut out so that she can move from being left with minus 4,000 every month. Many of us, this is our reality, and we finance this, this reality with a credit card. You must stop the bleeding there. So what did she do? She says, you know what? While I'm swimming in debt, I must take out all the luxuries. Maybe I must not have a helper who stays at home. Let me rather have a helper who comes in once a week. It might be cheaper. She cut out all the unnecessary things. If you go back to the Adventist home, page 393, Ellen White is writing there that while you are all in debt, um, cut out the, 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 the luxuries. Um, you know, deprive yourself of luxuries, even if it means you eat porridge and bread. Um, uh, you must try porridge and bread, man. That thing. That thing, that thing is very nice. And the point she's making is that while you are in debt, you don't deserve luxury. This thing of being in debt and you've got a rewinding pay TV, you don't deserve it. Be on time for your shows until you get out of debt. So she cuts out all these things and look at what she managed to do. After cutting out all these things, she's moved from being in the minus 4,700. She's now left with 300 rands every month just from cutting out all, the, all these things. She's managed to stop the bleeding and she's left with 300 rands. And then you are saying, what can someone do with 300 friends? The next step then she does. Remember, you must also not only look at cutting. You don't grow your wealth by just cutting your expenses. You must also grow your wealth by growing the top line. Can you find other ways to earn extra income? I know people make fun of network sales, but network sales, people make additional income. Maybe you need that to afford your life. Can you rent or sell unused things? Can you go to your boss and ask for a raise? The worst thing that will happen when you ask your boss for the raise what if the boss says yes, but what if he says no or she? What if she says no, but she at least tells you that we only give raise to people who do A, B, and C? You wouldn't have found out what, we do, what it will take to get a raise if you didn't have the conversation. Can you lecture on a part-time basis? Can you go and teach evening classes? Can you freelance? Can you have a, 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 a YouTube account? Can you be a waiter? Can you, what other things you can do? Now, how do I get rid of this of this debt? Remember now, Zotwa is now left with an extra 300 rents every month. We then say to Zotwa, can you list all your, all your debts? So she lists all the debt. Some of us have never even opened our, our statement. You know, if you notice that you don't even want to see, ah, yeah, yeah, there's in one, is a statement, I don't want to see them. Hey, confront that thing. You are never, never going to deal with that thing if you don't confront it, right? So she opens all the statements and she lists all the debt. I owe this much on the home loan. I owe this much on the clothing account. This is the interest rate I'm getting charged. She's starting to discover that I'm paying more interest on this particular one. This is how much I'm spending. And then she lists, and then she says, which debt do I want to start with? Then she starts with the most expensive debt. I'm going to rush through this in the next five minutes. You'll go through the slides when you see them. They're quite self-explanatory. Then she takes her 300 rands. Remember what Ellen White says there. She says, pay off your debt. Work them off as fast as possible. Start, this is what they call snowballing. She wrote this thing in 18 tons, I mean, so, and it's relevant in 2020. Now, what does she do? She takes the 333 rand. And she starts with the furniture account because it's the one that charges most interest. She, she takes the 333 rand, she adds it on the furniture account. Remember, she was spending, um, she, was, she was putting, I think, 1,000 something, and she adds the 333 rand. She actually finished that debt two months earlier because she was now paying more on that debt. She then moves on to the next one, the clothing account. On the clothing account, remember now, she, she used to pay 1,100 on the furniture account. It's now available because she's done with it. Remember, she used to have an, a surplus of 384. Right? She takes that, she's got 1,400 free cash. She, she takes that and adds it on the repayment of the clothing account. She was done with it three months earlier. There's nothing as exciting and as fail as finishing off your debt. She moves on to the next one, the personal loan. She finishes off her personal loan 10 months earlier. 
She's now free of consumption debt, and she's now, her, her wealth story is starting to look better. She no longer has consumption debt, but you realize that she didn't do any magical thing. How we get into debt is because of small gradual things. Uh, a takeaway here and a takeaway there. Do you know that a takeaway every day is about 30 rents, about 70 rents every day? It doesn't look like much, but at the end of the month, is about uh, 3,000 rands. You know, there's an exercise that we do at home every December when we start building our resolution. We print our bank statement for the whole year and we put it on, a, on, on an Excel. And we say, what have we been doing with our money this whole year? One of the things that we discovered, I'm trying to show you that it's the small things that get us into trouble. I'm wrapping off now. I found out one day that I've been spending about 21 rand per Red Bull every time I see a petrol garage, a petrol station. I was surprised that after a year, I had spent 7,000 rands on Red Bull. It's the small things they add up, right? So she did small things and she was able to get out of consumption debt. Now she's left with a credit card of 75,000 rands. Look at what she did. She went and restructured her debt. She's saying to herself, Yes, I've got a credit card of 75,000 rand. It is charging me interest of 14%. But my home loan is charging me interest of 8%. Remember, the interest rates have been dropping right now. So they're about 7 something percent plus, plus 1%. So she's on 8%. And she says, how can I do something? She goes and approaches the, the bank and says to the bank, can we restructure my debt? My home loan is sitting at, um, at 376,000. But my home currently is worth about, um, I think it was worth about 400 and something thousand rents, the EPT on the loan. She says to the bank, can I go and borrow 75,000 rents out of my home loan? And they allow it, this is what we call equity. And we'll talk about it on Friday when we talk about building and investing and building one. She takes the 75,000 that is charging her 8% out of the home loan. Well, the bank played around and said, we're going to increase your rate to 9%, but it's still better than the 14% she was paying. She takes this 75,000 and she doesn't go and throw a party. She takes it and goes and pays off the credit card and closes it. And then, and then, and then now she's left with just the, 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 the car account and she's, she's left with um, the, the home loan. That's all she's left with. And she's no longer has consumption debt. Now she can start building her world. Now she can start paying extra on her bond and starting to pay it off fast. Now, now what if these seven steps are not enough? You are saying, Eman Tolan, I've done all these seven steps, but Eman, I'm still in trouble. There are some options that you have. Can I spend five minutes on these options and then I'm going to kill it and then we take questions. One of the options you must never do is to avoid your creditors. This thing of when you see a private number, uh, I will give you a trick one day. When you see a private number, don't do it. When you see a private number, do this. You must do this with the phone. Say, hello, you are breaking until you hear who is it. Because sometimes the private number is the, is the company you are applying for and they are trying to call you for the interview and then you might miss the job. But if you do this, you can hear Mr. Story, you are owing, and then you just cut it, you are breaking. But anyway, my point is, don't avoid private numbers. The moment you avoid your creditors, they now have to hire people to find you. And when those people find you, you must pay for the people who are finding you. Suddenly, your, your statement also has the cost, the legal cost of finding you. Don't avoid them. Rather sit down and negotiate with them, and sit down and say to them, guys, all I can afford in repayments is this much. Can we restructure and rearrange our debt so that where I was left with 12 months, can we make it to be left with maybe 20 months so that we reduce my installment? It is much better than avoiding them. You go and negotiate. When it's already difficult, you can also go for debt cancelling. And debt cancelers, what they do is, instead of the creditors keeping, keep, keep knocking at your door and stressing, because it's very stressful when everyone is calling you, the debt counselor then starts dealing with your creditors. Now, one of the things you must, you must know is that debt counselors are running a business. When they're going to start restructuring your debt, they must charge you a fee, which is included in the installment. So they go, and some of them can, can negotiate with your, with your creditors to restructure your debt and start uh, uh, reducing your installments. But in those installments, they charge you some of their fees. The last resort is to then do debt consolidation. If all of that is not working, please, guys, don't rush for debt consolidation. What debt consolidation really is is that I've got a loan, I've got a loan, I've got a loan, I've got a clothing account, I've got, I've 
got a bond. And then I take all of these different accounts and I put them in one account. And there's a consolidator who takes this, this, all these debts and go and negotiate with all the lenders and say, you know what, I will settle the debt and then you owe that person. The problem with that, that's why I say leave it as the last resort. The problem with that is I was left with six months on the clothing account. I go and consolidate and that big loan is now going to be paid over five years. I could have finished this debt in six months. Now I'm in debt for longer just to pay lower installments. So don't play around with that. And maybe we can talk a bit about that um, in, 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 in our Q&A. Um, so, so those are, those are the, the, the other options that you have. When all else has failed, all else has failed, you, you, you end up being sequestrated um, and you are, you've got judgment and things are not going well. It's fine. You, 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 can, you can go and be sequestrated and wait for rehabilitation. Automatically, you can be rehabilitated after 10 years, but you can be rehabilitated even sooner. If your claims have been pulled in, or paid in full, you talk to the court. There are options. That do not commit suicide. Do not be so stressed so much. There are many options that you can follow to try and deal with your debt situation. I'm going to end it here. I've known, I know I've taken so long. Normally, the debt discussion can take up to three hours. We've tried to squeeze it in in 45 minutes, but it was just an awareness. I will stop here. Thank you very much.